thanks for pressing play. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. To turbocharge your growth, check out netsuite.com slash legends. And by my new number one bestseller with Heather Clancy, Niche Down. Check out nichedownbook.com. Today, we hang out with serial Silicon Valley enterprise entrepreneur, Russ Fraden. He's the CEO of a red-hot company called Dynamic Signal. And we have an awesome, wide-ranging conversation. And we tackle things like company building, category building, uh, overcoming failure, and why Russ Fraden thinks that MVP, minimum viable product, is a very bad idea. All right, all right, all right. Joey Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And Tom Waits said, the piano has been drinking, not me. <laughs> you got to love that one. Hello, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for joining us for this fantastic episode of Legends and Losers, where we try to hack the best minds in Silicon Valley, try to have real conversations worth sharing about what it takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life. And uh, I think we have done that with this uh, conversation with Russ. Uh, he is a serial uh, entrepreneur, CEO, deeply experienced in building enterprise B2B, uh, top-tier venture-backed um, uh, startup companies in Silicon Valley. He's having one of those great careers. I got introduced to him by my buddy Brian Asher, who is a partner at Venrock Capital, who's also uh, got an amazing track record. His epi uh, he joined us on episode 112 of Legends and Losers. If you haven't heard Brian's episode, I highly recommend it. He gives us uh, tremendous insights in uh, company building and uh, just legendary stuff. <laughs> And um, uh, Russ is uh, illuminating. He's fun. He's fast paced. And I really enjoyed having this conversation with him. If you want to check him out on Twitter, he's R F R A D I N, R Fraden. And for more on Russ and Dynamic Signal, check out our show notes at legendsandlosers.com. Here he is, the captivating Russ Fraden. Everyone says this, but it always starts with the team. And I, I'm very, very fortunate. I have uh, two co-founders of Dynamic Signal, one I've worked with for basically 22 straight years, and one I've worked with for 18 straight years across multiple companies. And so when you have this base level team of folks that you've known for a long time, that's a great way to start. You, you really can't replicate that. Obviously, there are some people who are sole founders of companies that have built tremendously successful businesses. So nothing against them. But at least for me, when you start with a team that you know and trust and have you know, been through good times and bad times with over the course of, I mean, hell, one of my co-founders I've been working with since I was actually a teenager and now I'm in my 40s, right? So that's a long chunk of time. And so it starts with a team. And then the majority of my career, 21 of the 22 years of my career, I've spent working in B2B enterprise startups, right? So a long time ago, I spent a year trying to fix wine.com, ignoring that everything else I've done in my career has been B2B. And so Look, my perspective is you should solve real problems for real companies with a fantastic team. And if you can do those three things, you will be fine, right? You will build a very, very, very successful company. And then, then the question is, how do I know what I'm solving is real? If I think it's real and I get to market and the customers don't like it, how do I understand? I hate the term pivot because it's become overused. It, it, it has become overused to the point that it no longer has a meaning in Silicon Valley. But the idea of what people meant around pivot and constantly tacking and constantly, you know, honing your strategy and honing your positioning and honing your category definition, all of those things, right? Uh, you know, you only learn those from being in the market and you only get the right to get those learnings from customers if you solve an actual real problem for real companies. So I, I love what you're saying, Russ, as uh, no surprise to you, I'm sure. And I guess my question is in our industry, and I think it's true in a lot of others, the founder, the CEO, uh, so many people have a product first uh, perspective. You didn't lead with that. You, you talked about solving real problems. Why does your head go there as opposed to build a legendary product first? So uh, legendary product is very, very, very important, of course. But in the enterprise world, right, if you're selling things to large companies, you need a fantastic product that actually solves a problem, right? So it's not a, uh, it, it's different. In the consumer world, there are a lot of things you can build and you can, it, you know, you can show people solutions to problems they never knew they had. You can build games. You can do other things that 
it's unclear that Fortnite is an amazing, amazing, amazing thing, a phenomenon, moneymaker, business, all that. It's unclear that it solves a problem other than a very high level problem of people's innate need to be entertained, which is fantastic and good for them. It's an amazing business. I think in the enterprise, look, ultimately I'm going to ask someone from one of seven buying centers in the enterprise to give me money for something. And so I have to solve some problem for them. It may be a problem they didn't know they had. Let's call that creating a new category. That's what we've done at Dynamic Signal, and that's what you spend a lot of time talking about. It may be just a better version of a product that exists in the world today where I can just do a better job. But in both of those cases, I'm still solving a problem you ultimately have. Yeah. Yeah. But is, do you find it interesting? I, I mean, I know that I, that I do that so many companies get so product focused that they sort of forget what problem they solve. And if, you know, I ask CEOs all the time, well, what problem do you guys solve? And, you know, often a bunch of bullshit comes flying out of their mouths. A hundred percent. Look, features are amazing, right? Having a nice product is, it's, of course it's important, right? If a dynamic signal product didn't work, wasn't best of breed, didn't look wonderful, employees didn't like it, customer, you know, our end users didn't like it, of course, that, that is a given. That is, if that didn't exist, there is no company. So this is not to minimize that at all. It's, you know, we spend more than half our money on everything, reporting to my co-founder around product development and technology and QA and all, like, of course. But at its core, Actually, I'd say early on at Dynamic Signal, we built a fantastic problem that didn't, the product that didn't solve a real enough problem, right? Early on at Dynamic Signal, when we look at what we really built when we launched the company versus where it is today and how, we, how the company uh, evolved over time, I would say we built the best product in an industry that we realized over time wasn't really a big enough industry to matter. And so I think, you know, Listen, even though I had experience and had done it before, I did the same thing at Dynamic Signal. I probably wasted $8 million and a year uh, trying to market the heck out of a really great product that didn't solve a big enough problem. And we were fortunate enough and experienced enough and understood the signal to noise, you know, understood the signal uh, from the noise of all of our various customer conversations to be able to realize, oh, you know, this product that we thought that solved these problems, this one really matters, right? And let's put all of our time and attention on that solution. And that's why we're doing very well. So, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, mouth sure. Russ, but uh, did you niche down then? Is that what you did? <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know that I'd say it that way. I think, I mean, sure, in that focus is always niching down, right? So sure, I guess what I would say is we started the company building a great product to solve this problem for our set of customers. And what we realized, thanks to the fact that we had a great product, we had enough trust from our customers to spend enough time with them to realize that there was a much bigger problem over here that we could solve with the exact same product. So I don't know that we niche down. I, I, I think I would say instead that we realized there was a much larger category of problem that the same product solved. And in all honesty, it was not my idea, right? This was my, in all, my idea for Dynamic Signal was wrong, right? The, the business I started was wrong. It was not worth pursuing. We are fortunate enough to have built such a great team and such great relationships with our customers that we were able to listen to them and listen to enough input from the market to realize the right gigantic thing to do with the product we had built. So th this is fascinating to me, Russ, because of course, to be a successful entrepreneur, part of what you have to have is vision. You have to be bullheaded. You have to have, I, I love this word, stick to or grit. Uh, but you also have to be smart enough to know when you're beating your head against the wall and maybe it's time for a new wall. And so how, how, did, how did you do that here? How did you, how did you figure out you needed to go in a different direction, particularly for someone like you who's so aggressive and bullheaded? I mean that in a, in a, a, a laudatory way. <laughs> Uh, so, look, a lot of it comes from the experience of having a team you trust, A, and B, having been a part of other things that have worked. What I'd say is in the early days of Dynamic Signal, the company was working fine. We had customers. They liked us. They were big-name customers. And if I just met you somewhere on the street, I could have told you a story about how things were going well. 
And it's only thanks to my success at Flycast, at Comscore, at Adify, at prior things that I was able to say, oh, you know what? This isn't working. And this is, I, I like to describe this to people, right? If you go and pitch 50 customers and zero of them are interested in your product, it's pretty easy to figure out that you are wrong. And if you go pitch 50 customers and 40 of them are interested in your product, fantastic, right? Actually, it's not really hard to figure out what to do in either of those two extremes. In one, you should just stop immediately. And the other, you should keep doing what you're doing. The tricky thing for entrepreneurs is always, what do you do in the middle? Which is you pitch 50 customers, 35 of them were interested in conversations, six of them turn into customers, but it really was a lot more work. And I think it's only with the experience of having been a founder at other things that worked or worked at other things that worked or been on the board of other things that worked. It's only with that experience that I was able to say, oh, you know what? This isn't working well enough. This isn't what success feels like. Yes, by the way, to your point earlier, the product was the best. Our problem was not that we were losing deals to competitors. That It's table stakes to have the best product or to try to build the best product. On top of that, you need a big enough market. And so, you know, part of it was experience. And then part of it, to my point from earlier, only was possible because of the team and the product. So a lot of companies fail. I actually like to point out that mostly companies fail because they're run very poorly, right? It's bad leadership and bad employees. It, it's, a, it's a very common reason companies fail. Are you it, saying not, shitty people uh, run shitty yeah. companies? <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's not interesting to talk about, but lots of people are bad at their jobs. That, that, is, a, that is a common thing across not just Silicon Valley, and it's not just you know founders in Silicon Valley. It's lots of people are bad at their jobs, and wherever they are. And so, because we had built a good team, and because we had built a good product, we had good enough relationships with the customers we were working with to get deeper and deeper with them and understand what the real issue was. Right? Understand where they really could help. Look, it's what you and I were talking about earlier. First, you write a book and build your brand and build a category around Play Bigger. And because that work was high quality and because people like your brand, then you earn the right to have the discussions with people where they start asking you other questions and you sit there and say, oh, there's a different way to grow and now I'm going to go to this other category. And if the first product wasn't good, if you were just some idiot that came out with a shitty book, Nobody would have thought to ask you any questions in the first place, and it wouldn't have led to book two. And so I'd say the same thing with Dynamic Signal, which is a lot of customers, this is why I hate the whole, whole concept around minimum viable product, right? MVP and lean organizations. I've always hated that. Because what it generally means is I'm going to have good marketing and a shitty product, and I'm going to get it in front of customers, and then I'm going to learn. And the problem is if I'm trying to work with General Mills or, you know, I don't Procter & Gamble or SAP or name, name your large global conglomerate, they're not going to have any real respect for me that I sold them a piece of crap. And so I'm certainly not going to earn the right to get their input on how I can make the product better. It's only because the product was of such high quality and the people were of such high quality that we were able to have the relationships to realize what we should be doing with the last six years of our lives. So you're against this concept of minimum viable product. Certainly in enterprise. Like, I, as I said, I've never built a successful consumer company. And so I, I, can't, I can't say whether it makes sense in, in consumer. In enterprise, absolutely not. If I'm going to sell a product for money to one of the largest banks in the world, one of the largest software companies in the world, one of the largest uh, grocery chains in the world, whatever, what, whoever they may be, how can they possibly ever respect you when, yes, you did a good job selling it to them and they deploy it and it's a piece of garbage? Right. You'll never, you can't recover from that. Your references are terrible. You, you are just, you might as well stop. And so my perspective in enterprise, like enterprise is expensive. You have to build a great product. You know, I, I love what you're saying. And uh, it also takes some time, you know, to do that, of course. Um, yes. And, and this notion that, well, let's just, let's just build a piece of shit, throw it out there and see what happens has always seemed kind of asinine to me. Of course, a hundred percent, of course. And it, it's not, I, like I said, I am sure there are successful consumer companies that have had an MVP in lean. And of course, look, one man's MVP is another man's, you know, version three of their product. So does our product today look better and work better than our product from five years ago? Yes. But at the time, what, one of the things, at the time, did our first product solve real problems for customers? Yes, they did. One of the big things I say, you know, in the enterprise world, in the SaaS world, 
uh, people talk a lot about churn, right? The concept of I signed up customer A as a customer. The reason SaaS companies become valuable is a year later, customer A pays me more money. The reason SaaS companies fail is a year later, customer A cancels, right? And if too many of them cancel, then you ruin the whole economics of what makes a SaaS company work. And one of the things I've always said to our team, always, 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 and I say it to our salespeople all day, every day. I think it's why our customer service people like me. But I say it to our salespeople always, every day. Don't lie about what the product does, right? The number one driver of churn is I lied to you in the first place. It's original sin. It's I said what I had to say to get the deal. Now you roll the product out. And man, of course you're going to be unhappy. There are other things that can drive churn, even if I told you the truth on the way in. Of course, and sometimes customers are unhappy with us for other things we've screwed up in our history. But in my entire career, the number one thing that drives ultimate customer unhappiness is the salesperson was incentivized by leadership to lie about what the product did in the first place. And so because we hadn't done that and culturally had never really done that, and we hadn't done it at Adify, we hadn't done it at Comscore, we hadn't done it at prior companies, because of that, like I said, we earned the right to learn more from our customers over time. Yeah, it's interesting. It seemed like for a long time in the old days, the, the paradigm in the software business was lie till they buy, right? <laughs> and, and to your point, if you lie to me about what your product does and it doesn't do those things, sure. what can, you know, it, we then don't, don't know what to trust you on and what not to trust you on, right? If you sort of lie to me about one thing, then we assume you're lying about a lot of other things. And by the way, maybe that was a great thing to do in the on-prem software world. That might have been a fine way to sell in the on-prem software world. But in the SaaS world where I'm picking solutions and, and at any given point, I'm spending more, I'm spending less, I'm shifting, I, I'm, I, I, I expect more from, from software, I expect to be ready immediately, it certainly doesn't work. Maybe in the old on-prem world, you know, for there were certain large software customers. I, I won't name them because almost every large software company in the world is a dynamic signal customer. But there are certain large software customers that were famous for telling you things that the product did that it wouldn't do for a year. And I understand why that was okay because the truth is once they won the sale, your switching costs were so enormous that it kind of just became built in, right? It just became well, a... And the implementation cycles were so long. It was right. going to take six months to load this thing into your data center and get it configured. and rah, 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 rah. So you sort of you, you playing this game where it's like, well, probably by the time they're going live, maybe we'll have some of the shit we told them we had. All right. of that, right? And, and SaaS says it just doesn't work. You're never going to recover from lying about what the product did in the first place. Well, yeah, and especially because of what you guys do, right? You're an app and you tell me, but I would imagine if I sign up to be a dynamic signal customer, I'm expecting to implement pretty quickly and I'm expecting the rollout to be fairly smooth, if not very smooth. And I'm expecting the first or certainly second or third time my employees log on to this stuff that they have a good experience, they like it, and they say, hey, I'm glad you bought this shit, and I, I love using it, right? Isn't that the expectation? 100%. Look, as you'd imagine, our customers with 500 employees deploy faster than our customers with half a million employees because they're larger companies. They're always going to take more time. There's more IT. There's, there's more resources. But of course, right, this has to be, you know, time to value matters a lot in SaaS. So maybe let's talk about how, uh, Russ, you think about uh, building developing, uh, providing incentives for managing a sales organization? So, sure. I Look, like I said, this is going to sound simple, but it starts with having a product that solves a real problem. Any good seller in Silicon Valley will certainly have worked at a few jobs in her career where she might have been a great seller, but she was selling something that half the customers wound up canceling. And the tax that has on your insatisfaction and will, even though you're making your money, it can't be overstated. And so my theory on hiring a seller is first have a product that solves a real problem and referenceable customers, and then you'll be fine. Then as long as you find great, competent sellers 
who are smart, who can use their resources internally, who can build great relationships, who can you know, build expertise and show great empathy when they're dealing with customers, they'll be fine. So we have a variety of sellers. We have sellers in their 20s and their 60s and men and women who are very successful here. Uh, so it's not about, oh, they have to be, you know, 47-year-old white guys that sold software, right? We have sellers, like I said, in that 40-year window who are men and women. And what they have in common is they get excited to sell a product that actually solves a problem. And they work very hard and they leverage their resources internally and they don't fucking lie about what the product does in the first place. <laughs> I love that. Now, how do you, once you sort of, you, you guys did this quote unquote pivot yeah. and, and you figured it out based on all the things you shared with me. Um, and then, so when you, did you find the vein shortly thereafter or sort of yes. what happened yes. next? Yes. So we, we, uh, I, we launched the product in the beginning of 2012 by the end of 2012, we had a bunch of customers, but we realized, as I pointed out, it's not that we were losing the race. We were ahead in a race that I no longer felt like trying to win, right? That, it, there was no, there, there, there was the, uh, the medal at the end was too small, right? It just, it just wasn't worth winning. And so we, we <laughs> you realized- You got to be king shit of Turd Island if you're staying yeah, on this path. Look, look to, your, to your, your point on category creation, right? We were dominating a tiny category, so who cares, right? Like- I, what we realized there was a much bigger category around helping companies communicate with and engage with their employees across a variety of uh, ways and a variety of industries and a variety of verticals. And so we relaunched the company in the beginning of 2013 and there you go. I mean, it's been five years and going quite well. And so uh, how do you think about category design? You know, I'm not sure I spend enough time thinking about it. I actually think one of my, and that, then I'll answer your question, but I think as a leader, I am much more of a sales and product leader than I am a marketing leader. Not, not, not good or bad, right? Every CEO needs to know what their strengths are and hire uh, people both that can help the organization in areas where they're strong and in er people that can help the er organization in areas where they're weak. And so I don't know that I spend enough time thinking about it early on. Look, over time, we spent a lot of time really partnering with slash hiding behind our customers. We work with the largest customers in the world. We're with the largest companies in the world. I think 20% of the Fortune 100 use us, and you know, we have the greatest collection of logos uh, on our walls and our headquarters that, that you could imagine. And so a lot of our stuff is we really work with our partners to define the category, right? The truth is, Gartner, let, let's take let's take convincing Gartner that your category matters, right? Gartner hears from CEOs all day, every day with some startup telling them why what they're doing is changing the face of the enterprise. That's great. It's much more powerful when they hear it from three of the top five auto manufacturers in the world, three of the hosp largest hospitals in the US, the three largest banks in the world, five of the seven largest software companies in the world. And so when you can do that in partnership with your large customers, when you have the luxury of selling to mega enterprises and winning there, to me, that's the best way to define the category. And so you're, you use your customers to help you evangelize? A hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah. We yeah. use our customers to help us with everything. All right. Half of the best ideas in the product have come from our customers because they're very intelligent practitioners. They spend all day, every day running communications, HR, marketing, sales, and some of the largest companies in the world. Of course, they know more about the challenges of communicating with a, you know, a far flung group of delivery folks or banking executives or you know, nurses or doctors, of course they know more about it than I ever will. And so it's only through our partnership that we're able to uh, do such a fantastic job. And, and how do you think, Russ, about scaling the business? I mean, you found the vein, you're using your customers to build the category, which is obviously super smart, um, as well as the other things you mentioned. Um, and, and now you got to scale this business. You got to hire people in what is arguably the most competitive hiring environment most of us have ever seen. Um, so how do you think about scaling the business and, and getting that part done? Yeah, so we're about 300 people today. We've probably added, uh, my guess is we've added 180 people in the last two years. Uh, you can't do that without financing. The best financing always comes from your customers, right? So the, the fact that we're able to sell a product for a lot of money to large customers is, is great. That's a big The customer is always and the best VC, right? The, the, the best. Um, although 
uh, sometimes they want stuff in the near term, right? The nice thing about VC is they give you money, you kind of get to spend it on anything you want, and their return profile is 10 plus years out. The bad side is you have to give them equity. Customers, they give you money. <laughs> you don't customers, think, you don't think you Asher would do all this stuff without some equity? <laughs> 100%, right. Whereas customers, they give you money now, you don't have to give them any equity, but you, you have to give them your time and attention and roadmap, right? So the right customers and the wrong customers can really play a lot in your company. Uh, I, I am convinced, I won't name the customer, but uh, back in the middle of 2012, let's say our average deal was sixty or $70,000. We had a handful of customers. And we had signed a customer that was going to pay us $2 million a year. So this is, you know, I don't know, we had $200,000, $300,000 of revenue. And we're going to sign a single customer that's going to pay us $2 million a year. And it was super exciting. It was actually to the point where they sent me the contract and I signed it. And I sent it back to them and they were going to process it for two days. And the deal fell apart. It's a very long story that I could spend another hour on. And I'm actually convinced it's the best thing that ever happened to our company. At the time, it didn't feel that way. Of course, that was pretty terrible. Uh, but the truth is, it, when one customer is 90% of your revenue, it's really hard to focus on the future and focus on scaling. I know that was an aside, so let me get back to answering your question. So, no, but I do, I, that is a very important point you make, right? And, sure. and it can happen in the enterprise business because uh, you are talking about big numbers, and sometimes one or two customers can be a giant percentage of your revenue, and you're right, that can be a bad thing. Sure, uh, great. If, right, if you have a large customer that's 3% of your revenue, fantastic. If you have a large customer that's 50%, the odds that you aren't just building a consulting company is pretty low, yeah. right? You, you can think you are, and of course, I'm sure there's other examples, but for us, I am pretty sure it would have been the, uh, what is it, the dog that caught the car, right? Like, we, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it would have hurt us. They would have defined too much of our roadmap. They would, we would have been, you know, losing them as a customer would have meant basically failing as a company. So I'm convinced it was one of the best things that happened to us uh, with, with many years of hindsight and therapy. Um, <laughs> yeah, no therapy, but with many years of hindsight. Um, so to your question about financing the business, look, we've, we're fortunate to be in Silicon Valley. We're fortunate to be building a great company with lots of experienced people. And so we've raised a decent amount of venture capital. We've raised somewhere between 85 and $95 million. I, I could get you an exact number. I don't, I don't remember, but somewhere in that range from some big VCs, from strategic investors uh, like Time Warner and Cisco and Microsoft some VCs like Benrock and Trinity and Rembrandt and Adam Street Partners and Acadian and Founder Circle Capital. So a lot of, a lot of great folks around the board, you know, uh, a smattering of, you know, super rich guy, angel investors and super rich women, angel investors. So, you know, all, all of that's great. So we've been financed in a relatively normal way for a Silicon Valley company, which is some amount of customers paying us money and some amount of venture. Yeah. And how do you, when you think about uh, fundraising, um, how do you think about how you want your cap table to look, your, your set of investors over time, and particularly constructing a board? So if you're fortunate enough to have options, right? Because I think the number one job of a CEO is to not run out of money, right? There are other important things that a CEO has to do in a day, but the unique important job of a CEO is don't run out of money. And so uh, to that end, if you wind up with one option, then that is probably your best investor and you should probably take that. When you're fortunate enough as we have been to have options, look, these folks that you are partnering with to join your board are truly your partners, right? You mentioned Brian earlier. So for your listeners, Brian Asher from Venrock had, had connected us years ago and Brian was the lead. Brian. Uh, was an investor in the company from day one, led one of our rounds of financing, is on our board, and is a fantastic partner. I worked with him at my prior startup as well. So what do I want out of Venrock, right? First, money, right? The money is really important. You can't forget the money. <laughs> but after the money, the truth is, if you really think about this, right, Brian is my very long-term partner. He can't fire me. I can't fire him, right? We We are actual partners in building this business. And so we're going to disagree plenty. We're going to agree plenty. Uh, we both have to be very clear on what our roles are. Uh, and so as long as you do that, like it is very important to have a board that can be very helpful to you over all the ups and downs we were talking about when we first started discussing, right? There will be, to my point on, oh, we're about to sell for a billion dollars. Oh, we're going to get a business or everything in the middle so far so good, right? 
Brian has been involved with this company for seven plus years. And at various points, we've needed help and we've needed advice and we've needed input. And so I've turned to Brian or Karen or Allison or Ajay or Scott or the other folks on the board um, uh, at different points to help us. Also Robin, but brand new investor. So uh, less of a history there. And so as we've done that and as we've built the business, like those partners have been very, very important to the business and advice and hiring and fundraising and, you know, things aren't going well. I need you to go to your partners and convince them to give us some more money because no one knew we'll give us money, right? So there's that end of the spectrum to, hey, help us with investors or help us get on an amazing podcast. <laughs> Yeah, and it is. It, it, you seem to have developed a skill uh, of how to do that and how to do it with a long-term relationship. And so I, I guess that leads me to a question, and maybe we can use Brian as an example because he's a buddy of, uh, uh, for both of us. There are those times in the development of a company where it can at least appear, let me say it that way, that what's best for the investors, what's best for the board, and what's best for the company may not always be aligned. And so whether it's a situation like that or a situation where, you know, maybe you feel vulnerable or let's say it's a less than perfect situation, how do you navigate um, that, that when, you know, uh, and, and build a long-term relationship? Let me ask it that way. So I, actually, I'll go back to my, my in general philosophy on the sales side. Well, so first, don't lie right? A lot of the bad relationships with VCs and founders start with lying to each other during the fundraising process. I'm lying to you about what's going on in the business. You're lying to me about how helpful you're going to be or your position inside your firm, right? So once you've gotten off on the right foot, like, yes, there are certainly times where what the CEO wants, what might be best for the company based on other people's opinions and what might be best for Brian at Venrock might diverge. I, I can't think of a time where that's happened at Dynamic Signal, but I've seen it happen with other companies where I've been on a board and there, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that, right? These are not black and white decisions. These are, there is a spectrum of things that any company should do. If you're going to raise money, should you raise $100 million, which is more dilutive, but gives you a lot more security? Or should you raise $20 million, which is much less dilutive, but you can't step on the gas as much as you want, or you don't have as much cushion if the market turns bad, right? That's a complicated decision that intelligent people can disagree, right? There isn't a right answer to that question. And so I've always had great respect for the fact that these guys are my partners, uh, that we don't have to agree on everything. We have a decision-making framework. And if I didn't think they were the kind of people that, A, understood that we were partners and understood that uh, I, they could be honest with me, but B, also understood that I am the CEO and I get to run the company. Uh, as, if, if you start from that basis, you'll be fine. So, you know, I can, if you want to give me hypothetical examples, I'm happy to talk about them, but my general perspective is like, sure, bad things can happen with companies or the company can be going well, but the CEO could have done something where, you know, they shouldn't get to be the CEO anymore. Uh, and, you know, there are high profile cases where not only the comp shouldn't the CEO be the CEO anymore, the CEO shouldn't be free anymore and should be in jail, right? So lots of, lots of things happen over the course of a career, not to me, but lots of things, you see lots of things over the course of a career. And so my general perspective has been, Brian is a, let's keep using Brian, he's a fantastic partner and he's always acted in the best interest of Dynamic Signal. But I'm, but I'm under no illusions at the fact that Brian wants to do a fantastic job for his LPs. And of course, there could be a time where we disagree. Yeah. And I got to believe at some level, you want, of course, you want to help him do a great job. You want to be a great investment for his firm and there, therefore oh, his well, LPs, right. of course, right? In the, in, the 90, in the 99, people make a big deal about, you, you can read a thousand blogs from young founders whose companies have failed. Uh, where, you know, the evil VC or this or that. And like, of course, there's bad VC behavior, of course. And I actually think more often than not, there's bad founder behavior, but of course there's bad VC behavior. But the 99% outcomes, my interests and my VC interests are highly, highly aligned. Yeah. The other thing I think about VCs, and I think it's true for everybody, um, but in this regard, particularly as you're thinking about building a board, if you're bringing in investors you don't know, um, at least in our world, you tell me if this has been your experience, Russ, uh, getting a handle on somebody's reputation is something you can do pretty quickly. Oh, 
Listen, I, especially if you're a VC and you've been out in Silicon Valley for a long time, I, I actually had a term sheet a couple of years ago. Uh, I, w- I won't name the VC because of what I'm about to say, but I had a term sheet a few years ago to raise $25 million at a time when I needed it. It was the first person to give me a term sheet. It's someone I knew a little bit. We had kind of been involved in a company together. We hadn't particularly worked together, but it was someone I, I knew and I'd heard decent things about. And uh, so I went and did some back channel reference checking and an advisor of mine I highly, highly respect who's been involved in some of the highest profile companies in Silicon Valley over the last 20 years said to me, Russ, you know, I don't speak with a lot of hyperbole. That person you just asked me about is the single worst human being in venture in Silicon Valley. I have never met a worse person. And so obviously I I took that to heart because it was someone I had a lot of credibility with. Uh, I didn't choose to work with that person and walked away from that person. And uh, actually, that person has been fired from their firm. So sure, like your reputation, re- not because of me, because of, oh, I guess this got around. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, this stuff really matters in Silicon Valley. I think it's important to praise people that are fantastic. And I think it's important to be open and honest about people that aren't. Well, and, and maybe there's a little bit of a diversion, but Silicon Valley's grown a lot since I've, I've been here. I've been here for 22 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's grown up as an industry. It doesn't feel as sort of cottagey as it did when I first got here. Sure. Um, and so this is maybe a little bit tougher to do. But as I have reflected on this exact issue, it's surprisingly not as tough as I would have thought, given the growth of our industry. We, it, one of the things I think is magical, and a lot of people maybe don't understand about Silicon Valley, is we are all one or half a degree of separation oh, from I all, agree. everybody, right? I don't know the data, but there's still only 40 venture firms doing the majority of Series A and Series B investing in Silicon Valley, right? And at those firms, there are still, I don't know, on average five or seven partners. Like it is a very, very small world. Sure, I don't know how I, if I were starting a company in Beijing tomorrow and I was raising money from investors, like that would be very different. But yes, it, in for technology firms in America, they're still backed in a relatively normal way from a relatively, so, you know, relatively small subset of the population. And so, yes, it is not at all hard to understand very quickly these are the best people these are the worst people or here's a great picture of these folks and i find i don't know if you find this it may also be sort of where i am in my life but uh i seem to spend more time now than i remember spending on these kind of back channel references oh sure i met with so and so today they say they know you and i go "I i don't remember that fucking guy like i don't even i sort of maybe have a vague memory or whatever i just i got an email recently from a, a good buddy of mine we worked t- together years ago he's a ceo and uh and he said oh i just met with this guy and he you know the way he, he said it seemed like you guys are really good friends it's like i think i met him once in the late 90s like i and he's like oh wow right like and so the this back channel uh referencing if you want to call it this reputation sure. check seems to be something that happens a lot so the nice thing with that, that rarely happens to me because I'm famously grumpy and antisocial. And really all I do is go to work and then go home and hang out with my kids. So no one really knows me that well unless you happen to coach soccer with me or something like that. <laughs> uh, so, so I don't have a lot of people say, oh, Russ loves me just because, you know, uh, I, I'm mostly home hanging out with my kids. But yes, look, as the valley has exploded and a lot of it is the growth of angel investing, right? A lot of it is there are people who I – don't know particularly well, but I've known them for 15 years and we've invested in 12 companies together and we've worked together in some way. And so, sure, you just have this tangle of relationships. One of the things about it, by the way, is because, and this is something I think people in traditional industries don't, don't spend a lot of time thinking about. So my, my father worked at one company, it's a long story, but kind of worked at one company for his entire 40 plus year career. And one of the things I always said to him about, about Silicon Valley is, because the companies tend to be small, right? And forget market cap. They tend not to employ many people. The largest companies in Silicon Valley still don't employ that many humans, A. B, most companies fail. After they fa- if they don't fail, the second most popular thing to happen is they are acquired, right? The third most popular thing to happen is they wind up going public and building a long-term enduring business. So because of category A and category B, most people in Silicon Valley, by their nature, have a very large external network, right? 
it is very possible to build to spend 30 years at IBM in the HR or finance or accounting or operations functions and have 90% of your social network be coworkers at IBM. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. In a company that large, internal relationships are hugely important. The truth of the Silicon Valley is a few hundred people work at Dynamic Signal. So of course, the major and, and by the way, the most likely scenarios are, I, though I don't think it will happen for us, but, but it's we will fail. If we're not fail, more likely is we'll be acquired. Right, the least likely is you talk to me 10 years from now and I'm running a public dynamic signal that I've been running for 10 more years. That's what I'm building for, but we, both, we all know the data. So the truth is you just wind up in a world where people have very large external networks because I worked at that company, I used to work for that guy, but then he started a company, so I worked for him again. Then I quit, I started my own company, he became an investor, I hired his wife, now she's my co-founder, she's fantastic, then she started a company, I wind up an investor, and so because you have these relationships where uh, there's so much, kind of, there's so much movement between companies, you just wind up in the world where it's pretty easy to reference people. Whereas, you know, if you spent your entire career at Allstate, which is a very reasonable thing to do, it's a very long-term company, then how am I gonna reference you if I don't know a lot of people at Allstate? Yeah. The other thing I find interesting, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, Russ, is everything you just said happens amongst competitors. Sure. Right? So, I mean, not that long ago, we had uh, Bruce Cleveland on the podcast from Wildcat Ventures. Well, Bruce and I competed against each other back in the CRM wars in the 90s, right? Sure. He was at Siebel, I was at Vantive. And we were trying to kill each other, and he, he killed right. me, for the record. He, as I like to say, he destroyed okay. my self-worth. He got, he, and got, he got killed later. Time. Yeah, he got killed later by somebody else and lived by the sword, died by the sword. But, and, and he and I have always had this mutual respect, even when we hated hate, in you know, kind of air quotes with a smiley face after it. Um, and, and now I, I love him. He's working on a new book. I'm trying to help him with that. He invited me to come speak to his portfolio. At the big, they did this big ding dong event, and, and, and we have this relationship. And then uh, just recently, we had David Sachs on, on the podcast as well. Another great example, founder of Yammer. I was on the board of Jive. There was, you know, we were trying to smash the shit out of each other. And actually, he and I ended up doing some work together. Uh, and, and we've developed this friendship. And so everything you sure. just said, I have found in my life to be also sure. true with like, like competitors who you're going head to head with. Yeah, I, look, absolutely, because... People I competed with in 1997 became my customer in 2001, became my business, became my competitor again. I, I can think of one person who I competed with him in 98. He was my customer in 2001. He was my competitor again in 2005. And then I was talking to him about joining my current company as a board member. So absolutely, sure, because because people have – because people work at so many companies, just because of the structural issues we talked about, right? The nature of VC, companies start and then fail, and if they don't fail, they're acquired and they become part of something else. Just because of that nature, people have long, diverse careers. Yeah. And so um, how do you think about your, your career in the context of the rest of your life, being a dad and, and the things that you do outside of the office? And how, how does it all knit together in your head, your whole life, so to speak? So really the only things I do are work, hang out with my kids and run. And so, you know, in any given week, I'll spend more time on one of those three and less time on the other one of those three based on what's going on. But that, that's kind of it. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a very small number of interests, which, which is very helpful. I, I think that's important if you're a founder, actually. When, if you're a VC, you can have 100 interests. But if you're a founder, you really have to want to go run your company every single day. And so, you know, how do I think about it? I as I've said many, many times, I, I had kids on purpose. I wanted to have them. Uh, they are fantastic. And so I spend lots of time with them. And the time I don't spend with them, I spend running Dynamic Signal or actually running. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, Work-life balance as a phrase is kind of always something that's bothered me. Yeah, it's... look, they're, they're, really, they're really integrated. It's one of the reasons my wife has been a fantastic partner is I, I'm on top of being a fantastic person, one of the reasons she's a fantastic partner is she's been an investment banker her entire career, which is a synonym for working a ton. And so the truth is, 
my life and her life and our work lives and our personal lives are integrated. That just is how it works. So I, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about work-life balance. Be, I, I, there are some people who have miserable jobs or have a hard personal life. I've been truly blessed to work with amazing co-founders and have amazing professional success and have an amazing wife and amazing family and amazing kids. So I, I can't, I don't really have a horror story along any of those dimensions. I've, I've so far so good, at, at least for uh, first 41 and a half years of my life. <laughs> and so, you know, my perspective is, you know, my life, my work life, my wife's life, her work life it is just integrated. I actually literally yesterday, this is a, this is not an example just for the, just uh, what that I'm making up. Literally yesterday, I, my daughter's preschool year happens to be ended. She's going to kindergarten next year. And my sons who are in second and fourth grade, uh, their school doesn't end for a week. And we had our company annual summer picnic yesterday. So I stayed home in the morning with my daughter, picked my sons up from school, brought them to the annual company picnic. If you go on Instagram or Twitter, you can see the pictures where all four of us got the Dynamic Signal logo painted on our cheeks. My wife had a conflict, so she couldn't come. Uh, and then I left that picnic at two o'clock to come to the office because I had a meeting with an investor. Yeah. It must have been odd for the investor that it's probably the first meeting they ever walked into where this is a founder in their 40s who walked in A, in shorts, and B, with their face painted. But it was fine. And I think it's actually a great example of how your work life and your personal life are integrated. Yeah, and so clearly you're a guy who's who's not afraid to uh, be yourself at, at work, even in front no. of an investor. Look, I did offer to paint their faces and paint our logo on their faces. They, they <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you think about the future, Russ? For in what way? Space travel, Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, what do, what, do, what do you think is going to, yeah, is, is, are we going to be using Bitcoin to buy space travel? Yeah. No, exactly. I meant more specifically so, for dynamic signal and kind of where, where you see yourself in, in the future. So, so for dynamic signal, look, we think we're building the best employee communications and engagement platform for companies all around the world. There are 50,000 potential customers and we have, I don't know, hundreds. And so, there is enormous growth in this category. We're clearly the one that built the category. We're clearly the leading company today. I don't say that with any great ego. You know, you have to be very paranoid about large companies that could come after us or companies in other spaces that come after us or the little companies that we spend the last five years beating the hell out of coming after us. And so, you know, we, we're in a competitive environment, but I feel good about what we're doing. And it's an enormous category. And so, you know, Hopefully you'll be talking to me 10 years today from today and I'm still running Dynamic Signal and it's just a much larger independent public company. And uh, I'm still, you know, my kids are leaving school on their own and driving their own cars to our company holiday picnic or yeah. company summer picnic. I love it. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on, Russ? No. <laughs> well, great. Listen, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer other questions, but no, no, not particularly. Like I said, I, I think if you, if you work with fun, wonderful people and, and build a product that solves a real problem, you wind up with a fantastic culture and you wind up being the kind of company that you want to go to work at every day and your employees want to go to work at every day. Well, and I just, um, you have a clarity of thought and your, your passion and enthusiasm, it just, it, it, it screams, it comes out of you. You, you know that, right? I'm delightful, as I tell people. <laughs> All right. Well, Russ, I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been a wonderful conversation. You're, I think you're emblematic of, of a lot of the greatest qualities of, uh, of awesome entrepreneurs, of legendary entrepreneurs. And uh, I wish you a tremendous amount of luck in making it happen at Dynamic Single. Thank you a ton. Good luck with the new book. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. I'll, uh, I will happily get you a copy. And I really do appreciate that you read the first one. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Thanks, Russ. You too, brother. Bye. Whew. If you think this was a conversation worth sharing, why not share it right now? Um, if you're using mo most social, most uh, uh, pod, pod player, pod, pod player, podcast player, <laughs> you know, you'd think if you had a podcast, one of the things that you should do is learn how to talk properly. Uh, most pod cast player apps say that five times fast will allow you to share it uh, you can email it to somebody right now who you think might get something out of this conversation and uh, we would love you just a little bit extra if you help grow legends and losers and shared this episode and by the way if you wanted to help us grow legends and losers we would be forever grateful if you gave us a review on apple uh, podcasts on spotify or anywhere else you consume legends and losers now 
Our founding sponsor, NetSuite, want to help you want to help you succeed and grow. And one of the main reasons companies fail to scale is uh, they're not able to support their growth. Uh, I've seen lots of uh, high potential companies in high potential categories fail because they couldn't execute. NetSuite is the platform for growth. Uh, NetSuite has deep and wide capabilities to help you manage every aspect of your business. And NetSuite is offering you, uh, as a Legends and Losers listener and subscriber, a free 60-minute growth review. Uh, so go to legendsandlosers.com, and while you're there, you can set up a time to meet with a uh, NetSuite expert to talk about challenges, barriers, and, of course, opportunities to turbocharge your growth, get real visibility into your profits, your cash flow, and even your HR. So check out netsuite.com slash legends. And if you want to get in touch with us, uh, email blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Lockhead with two H's. All right. We would like to thank Russ's company, Dynamic Signal. Check them out at dynamicsignal.com. And the new number one Amazon bestseller by Heather Clancy and myself, Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. Why not pick up a couple hundred copies for everyone you know uh, today? Verve Coffee, the leader in West Coast artisan coffee. Uh, you can find them in Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and always at uh, vervecoffee.com. The amazing folks at OneLifeFullyLive.org. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life by first helping people uh, have the tools to uh, build their financial success on which they can build their life success. Our new podcast, it's a hit podcast. It's called Six Minutes of Legendary. It's a new audio experience that combines music and clips from Legends and Losers together in, uh, in the kind of a, kind of a track, uh, something you've never heard before. Check out Six Minutes of Legendary on Apple Podcasts. Our good friends at equitydirectory.com. If you're in the startup ecosystem, you got to be on Equity Directory. Check out Equity Directory. Com. And if you are in the B2B space like Russ is and you want a corporate website, check out Atrenet, A-T-R-E dot N-E-T. They build B2B corporate websites that present your company uh, in the best possible way and help you uh, gain customers and close sales, Atre.net. Uh, bottleneck virtual assistance. Is it time for you to get some help? Uh, you need to scale yourself a little bit? Check out Bottleneck dot online where you can leverage the power of a virtual personal assistant and uh, one of the, my favorite places to go for the latest marketing content the marketing journal check out marketingjournal.org and a nonprofit we love kiva.org these are the folks helping entrepreneurs in developing in the developing world with microfinance loans if you want to make a difference for small entrepreneurs check out kiva org. All right. We need to remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. We must remind you that uh, this podcast clearly was produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Uh, teach entrepreneurship. Support your local venture capitalist. Uh, remember to listen to uh, Iggy Pop and that David Lee Roth was right. There's no stopping the Cretans from hopping, only by fresh, free-range farm eggs. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. Hey, Colin. This oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Dr. Larry Nasser. Sorry, Larry. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for being with us uh, for this episode. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon on Legends and Losers. <laughs>